Okay, so I want to play an improv game with Jude live on air. And as soon as I mentioned it, I was like, don't make me do that. You said and, you were going to uh, do it. Yeah, but then as soon as you said that, I was like, that means you should definitely do improv. Oh, no. Because it's the kind of response. It's the kind of response where when somebody is like, no, no. So, Because here's the thing. So we were actually playing this before we started recording just to help get us in the zone a little bit as well it's called eight things so Very you fun. just like yeah you just say eight things I, I give you i give the i give jude eight things to say i'm like okay tell me so what i said was like randomly just comes to me as like eight things that a basketball player would wear and then she just reeled off eight things right and it's just the whole idea is making connections and saying random shit and uh, not judging yourself for what comes out of your mouth because it doesn't even have to do have anything to do with the thing that comes out of your mouth uh, to the, with the, the with the proposition at hand, and um, and then I was like, okay, great, let's do it on air. And she went, no, <laughs> don't make me do this, please. Don't make me do it. No. Yeah, so so I was like, fine, fine. And then when somebody says that, I'm like, that means you should be somebody who tries improv because right. it pushes you out of your comfort zone. But it's such a it's such a good rush and it's it's a surefire way of hitting flow state in fact yeah yeah you were very good it's, at it when i when i saw you live you were very good i oh, appreciate that thank you your whole group was, was um, very good yeah it was good i mean it's great it's just yeah just it's it's a, it's a really a team effort as well which is great about it, it really everybody is. just uh coming together and uh, you got to support each other because if you shoot anyone mm. down, then it's like, mm. oh, shit, um, audience can tell yeah, that things ain't yeah. going well. Um, but if you're sucking together, <laughs> it's it's great. And uh, it's kind of funny as well. Yeah, but that's that's that community. And you won't suck together because you're trying to pull each other up, aren't you? So mm. there wasn't yeah. any of that. It's like if someone yeah. I don't think any of you lost the thread to me anyway, but you might have felt like you lost the thread. But you were pulled up by someone else and everyone really wanted you you all each each wanted each other to do really well so yeah oh, it was really good and actually I, yeah. I, I, I even though I've stood on stage I've never mm. improv on stage and right. I always had the protection of my music I think I did mu mm. I think I did music I think I did a performance once from memory and I really right. messed it up so okay, right yeah, I have like That's quite bad memories of it. Yeah, I, I did, and it was piano, which is is not my best uh, best playing anyway. And it mm. was a really long piece. It was about a fifteen minute piece, and I had to. You were playing it. piano. Yeah. Oh right, because yeah. I only know you for playing clarinet. I didn't. Oh know you no, did I that. play piano as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh jeez. Well. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And my my teacher made me play this whole. Like, I think it was a concerto. It was something from memory. And I kept, hmm. and in the, in the performance of the competition, I kept stopping at every kind of section. And it, oh my God, it was stressful. It was so stressful. Hmm. So I have bad memories of kind of memorizing stuff and improv or whatever. So yeah. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Well, I did, yeah. Like, did you play piano to the same level that you played clarinet? No. No, basically right. piano... I had to play piano to audition for music college. You can't only audition with one instrument. You have to be able to play another instrument. So mm. I took up piano when I was, I, I probably had it in my head. So my teachers are like, you've got to take up piano. So I took up piano probably when I was 12 and right. basically got to, I think, I think I got to grade eight before I auditioned for music college. So mm. yeah, it was just, it was like a, a necessity it was just one of those things that i had to knock out to, to try and audition for music and get into college yeah. so yeah. yeah i just got i just got excellent at something just for shits just because i had to yeah right yeah great jesus right. you got people who are like oh we really love to play this instrument oh but this is just this is so difficult and i'm like oh, i just had to do it and i did it and i got the highest grade you can achieve in a short space of time just so i could audition for college right. yeah 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 just just one of those things that you do right <laughs> But you know the really sad thing is I I, I really struggle now and I'm I'm mm. like C D <laughs> A <laughs> It's like that bit in the Goonies, I don't know if you ever remember it, but you know when she's trying to yeah. get the teeth on the pipes. So that but I you know, yeah. if I put my mind to it I could probably play stuff again. Mm. So yeah. 
But um, All right. Yeah, I'm sure I told you I played piano. I don't think so. I think I only know the whole clarinet stories. The clarinet thing, yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. Did did you did you learn by reading music or did yeah. you? Right. Okay. Um, yeah. I was yeah I was wondering if you. Well, here's the thing. Like uh, my mate Hard, shout out to Hard, who's a lead guitarist of his band called Imperium. Hard. I highly recommend him. Um, people go listen to them if you, especially if you're into heavy metal, thrash metal. Um, oh yeah. He like it's funny. Me and him picked up the guitar at the same age, about nine or ten, I think it was. Um, but he carried on, and I didn't. Right, and this is a beautiful example of sort of like you know just just divergence of like when one stops and the other one doesn't, and just how good someone gets because he's right. freaking class. And uh, the amazing thing is, at least the last time I checked, is he just learned everything intuitively by listening to stuff, finding okay. some tabs, and then learning that way. So I don't think he could tell you what an E is, <laughs> you know, like what a chord is or something, but right. he will, he will play, he will play you something. So I find that really, really interesting where, um, That's amazing. yeah, you just develop that skill, like in a completely informal kind of way yes. and, um, just smash it out and you know, you're on the other end of the spectrum. So yeah, but yeah. look at Jimi Hendrix, right. like mm. Jimmy, Jimmy right. learned taught self-taught. So many mm. of the greats were self-taught. So I'm sorry, I'm yeah. laughing because that really looks like a beer that you're drinking. <laughs> I know it's not, it's too much, but no. um, it's like yeah, that. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a beer drinker, obviously, but um, this kind of pretends like it's a beer, but it's got a nice really little does. fizz to it. Good, Friday good, good night. for your health. Why not? Friday night. Exactly. Fermented, fermented foods. <laughs> <laughs> Friday night litness. Fermented <laughs> foods for your Friday nights. That's uh, fermented and, uh, Fridays. <laughs> and uh, uh, water in a in a plastic bottle, brilliant. Yeah, just make sure it's BPA free. <laughs> I think it is. I think we're good. Yeah, um, but yeah, um, do you know but what? Yeah. My, bro my my brother was a self taught drummer, and he's mm. he's one. Of, he is probably one of the best musicians that I know. Um, phenomenal drummer. Mm. Uh, probably beats me hands down as a musician. Um, right. Wow. I just took, the thing is, like, I I took the classical route. So, mm. um, and you know what, when you take the classical route, when someone does tell you to improv or try and write music, you are a bit like, well, if we're in C major, then we need to transpose <laughs> that. And it's not as intuitive. So yeah. I, I think, I think right. your, your friends and my brother and everyone that I know that writes music is probably way more intuitive than me at writing music because they haven't got that formal training, whereas I'm probably a little bit too structured and set in my ways because I've I've been taught how to write music. Like when we were in university, we had to write Bach chorales in the style of Bach. And it was like, it's really I hard. The, I love the face where you, you pull Bach. when you say that, like, in the style of Bach. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> as if it can't, it can't appeal to anyone else apart from the you know, stiff upper lip people. <laughs> but it was, it was. It was quite, it was so structured at uni and, and all throughout my musical career that mm. there was almost not room to just like let it all hang out. Mm. And then, you know, I hung out with DJs and I hung out with producers and, and they were so fascinated by the fact that I was so classically trained. But I don't think I could have ever fitted into how they wrote music. It, it was so different, mm. you know, trying to write drum and bass is very different to writing bar chorales. So <laughs> right. I don't know. <laughs> yeah okay oh, yeah. so uh, when you say don't fit in like you don't, well i'm sure and this is me being a total white belt novice oh, yeah, in understanding this kind me. of stuff as well but uh just from a from principally speaking i'm sure like you would be able to offer them something right yeah yeah they were so really they're, fascinated they're, by it yeah mm, and uh we, because I, I think yeah go on sorry well just simply because even something which seems as um uh, what's the word like it not necessarily improv based but something as structureless as music it does actually have a baseline structure to it like um music, it's something though. crazy yeah. yeah exactly and it's something like you know of all the pop songs that have ever been made like they they follow the same five principles uh, like 80 percent of them or something like that and if they don't it's like, it's like oh, what's this this isn't right yeah. um <clears throat> And that's just in pop songs. So then, uh, yeah. So I imagine that there's uh, there's something helpful about what you could bring to bring to them and their free flowing style of maybe 
producing music? Yeah, I, I think I think it's it's more like drum and bass is very structured, and I hang around with a lot of drum and bass DJs and producers. Right. Um, uh, you know, it's all structured. It's all four four. It's it all has it all has an intro. It has a drop. It has a, you know, a middle section, whatever. But I think it was more that it's like you guys know what you want to write. You know how you want your music to sound. It's like what can I bring to you other than a little bit of avant garde or a little bit of atonal like dissonance and I'm not sure that's going to work in what you're trying to do. I think it was more that it's like they liked the idea that I was classically trained and I knew how to write music. But the reality is, is that sometimes it doesn't fit in with how you structure things because I was very sort of like offbeat, you know, I, I, I often music that I was playing was in six, four or 12, 16 or some crazy three, two and, and, and uh, you know, in dance genres, that you, that doesn't work. Uh, mm. Some just do dance genres. Other dance genres, like there is electronica out there where they do use weird time signatures, and there are some metal bands that use lots of crazy time signatures, and Hans Zimmer has been known to use crazy time signatures as well. But right. <clears throat> just, just with the people that I was working with, it was like 4-4 four, four structured, beat drops, you know, do all that. But... Yeah, mm. I never really did in the end. I, I I can't remember. They were all like, oh, yeah, let's do that. And, and then I never really wrote with them. So, mm. yeah, it's one of those things. Just hung around with them. Yeah, yeah. Went clubbing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, we'll do all this amazing shit. It's like, no, let's just get shit-faced on a Friday night. <laughs> yeah. Let's just go out and get pissed. Just not yeah. do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's that's interesting. Because, um, yeah, I think I sent you that um, cover it was the yes. oh, what's what's the uh, two thousand and one Space Odyssey track? What's that called again? Thus spake. Oh, I can't remember. Oh, sorry. I you'd know. Hang I on, you'd sorry. Know. Ah. No worries. Sorry, no, thought, my phone just went off. No, it's fine. I thought I thought uh, um, I thought you'd remember I can't the name, remember but it was what just it was no. But yeah, but I think uh, people know the. 2001 a space odyssey track um you, you, you'd yes. be able to easily find yeah. it anyway but there was that sick like jazzy cover of it as well and you just weren't yeah. expecting it yes. to, to to drop no. and it was like that is class like when you just kind of reimagine something right yeah. um because usually i just find like uh, it just seems like nothing seems original these days as well i just keep finding out that a lot of the popular songs that uh were good were actually basically sampling or covering something else like i didn't even realize gangster's paradise was just <laughs> from like coolio for like you know i was like 10 11 years old i was like oh my god this is the best track ever blah blah <laughs> and uh, it's actually you know stevie wonder wrote it like in 1976 um his i did not something. know that either yeah yeah exactly so they just wow. lifted it completely but um uh, so i was like oh damn um and then you know he made it made it his own in a way and then eminem as well like my name is that's something that's taken that's sort of samples oh, yeah. yeah sample something from the 70s or whenever it was there's just loads yeah. of tracks like that and um yeah. so yeah it just makes me makes me wonder about um yeah <laughs> makes me wonder about originality these days as well it just seems like so much stuff is getting sampled but even with films like i just feel mm, like yeah I, I, we went. Nara and I went to the cinema yesterday, and all the hmm. all the adverts for um, oh, Snake Eyes. Is that oh, what okay. It's yeah, yeah, I think so. It's that. Um, Do you know what G? Metal Gear Solid movie or something? Or yeah, GI Joe. Yeah. GI Joe. That was it. I fell asleep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> as well, as long as Noah had a good time. He had a great time. He he was loving it because it was all kind of Japanese based, and and he's so into ja Japan. But um, mm. oh my god, it was so cozy in the cinema, and it was dark, and I was just so tired, and I fell asleep. And it, I'll be honest, it wasn't a great film. Um, yeah. so, <laughs> so I fell asleep. Can't imagine it was. Um, um, but all the adverts prior to the feature were. It was just like, I don't know. I felt like there were a lot of old films made new for a new generation. Mm. And don't ask me what they were because I was just zonked out. I don't know what. Was, <laughs> yeah, but I was like. I've, I've watched this before and yeah it was mm. I feel like there's a lot of just churning out of old stuff and so yeah. music's not exclusive to that I think film mm. the film industry are doing all of that as well and yeah fully it's a yeah bit of a it's, shame. It's, it's like originality people come on mm. yeah I think uh there I remember reading about it a while ago uh this it was some ridiculous stats of like of like every 
I don't know, not every 10 years, but basically I just kind of remember it was like 10 or 20 years ago, about two thirds of the scripts that were being um, uh, turned into movies were original screenplays. Mm. And oh, then yeah. about uh, 10 years later, it was like just a quarter, a quarter of all scripts were original screenplays that got turned into movies at these um, studios. And he was just like, what? Like, wh why isn't wow. originality getting uh, getting given the... Because given the go here do you think it's to do with the fact that people just want i don't know when they go to the cinema i don't know if these are right but just want action and a lot of the great action films are just being rolled out again and mm. it's just guns and cgi and let's make this bigger and better and more colorful and we can re you know redo the films that have had such power before do you think mm. it's that that it's, it's well, an easy money maker do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's an easy money maker. There is that side of for me. I think like yeah, I want to be entertained when I see a movie as well. But I also mm. I want something more than that. I do see it mm. as an art form, which is like movies for me is like when done right. It's like one of the most one of the noblest things you can do in the sense that you're telling stories and this is how like this is this is how we resonate with the world that yeah. we're in is through storytelling. So when that just gets dumbed down, um, I I think that. I think that's doing people a disservice overall. Like, uh, let's like as an example, um, yeah, it's constantly like make sure you catch people's attention, just give them some fluff and make them feel good, and then just leave, and then that's it. It's all good. So it's kind of like that whole, uh, like, uh, uh, like a, it's like a version of just feed them, feed them something uh, that gives them a good like dopamine rush, and then like not you know don't yeah. give them any like kind of substance with it. But um, mm -hmm. but as an example, like you know since podcasts and especially like long form podcasts, they've like it's basically showing that there is a desire to consume something with and not just consume something, but be involved and engage with something which is. Mm -hmm. um, which has substance, which isn't just like no frills. We're just fulfilling a, a time. Um, uh, we're just fulfilling the basics of entertainment and then that's it. Um, mm. I think the explosion, like the, the kind of explosion and um, also maintaining of like the engagement in long form podcasts where people are having discussions and people want to hear more of those type of things mm. is, uh, is testament to the fact that there's, there's more to it and people want more than just being entertained. Um, but it's kind of like this self-fulfilling prophecy as well, I guess, where you only churn out shit, which is supposed to make you feel good in the moment, then you forgot about it the next day. And then you just keep doing that. And then there is no feedback for actually what is truly wanted, whether you actually want those, more of those like Chris Nolan type movies and not just cerebral movies, but something with heart, mm -hmm. something with soul, something with substance, like good dialogue, proper story structure, not just like, here's just a bunch of special effects and some fight scenes or, um, you know, uh, and then, you know, go enjoy yourself. Um, mm. So you don't really get that signal, um, which is a bit of a shame. It is a shame. So I don't know. Yeah, so I think that's one of the things, um, potentially. Um, I think there's basically not giving viewers enough credit and also, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, not giving viewers enough credit and then just kind of there's a, there's a lack of, uh, like on like, proper signal in that feedback loop. There's there's a bunch of noise and not a lot of signal. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of wondering what the demographic is of podcasts and who's listening to that and the demographic mm. of people going to films and who's watching these big CGI films and and why there isn't this this market for. I don't know, the films that we love, like the Christopher mm. Nolan films and the, you know, the beautiful, like well thought out films, because there are, they are few and far between. And, mm. you know, I'm, I'm waiting for the next Tenet or whatever. So, mm. yeah. I, and, and yesterday, really, it really showed. It was just like, it was just like guns, action, terrible <laughs> lines and... I was like, oh my yeah. god, this is fucking shit. But no, <laughs> no, I loved it. So it and it was twelve eight. Yeah. So it's that kind of mm. it was appealing to that preteen tween can't quite get into a fifteen uh, mm. generation, I guess. So yeah, right. Yeah, it's also yeah. 
Yeah, I wonder. It's also like what are we what are we feeding the kids? I know. As well. Like but then what? Tenet was 12 as well. So that's maybe it's not quite right. But yeah, I think mm. there's not a great selection out there in terms of mm. what you can go and watch. It's all, you know, even even as adult films, there's like Saw and the latest mm. Saw film. And, and I'm just like, no, that doesn't really appeal to me. So mm. yeah, right. there's not a huge yeah. amount of choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just kind of it's kind of like Friends, right? It's like yeah, first four series really good, and after that it starts to become a caricature of itself, and uh, yeah. and uh, and then it just keeps going. You're like, oh my god, this is this this is getting sad, you know? It happens yeah. with every show that runs for too long, and then you know that's yeah. basically what happens with oh uh, with the movies as well. Probably looking at it like you know Fast and Furious, for example. There's like nine of oh, them, and they just get god. more and more ridiculous, and uh, you're just like, oh, okay, well, I don't know. Am I? Do I feel like I've been entertained, or do I feel like I've just eaten fast food equivalent of uh, of movies? You know, um, and that's where that's kind of what it feels like. I feel like I've just consumed a bunch of junk, and it's like for like while you're doing it, it feels all right, and then you leave the cinema okay. or whatever, get off the peel yourself off the couch. You're like, that was. I don't feel so good. That wasn't great. <laughs> yeah. You know? It's just yeah, that's basically what's happening with uh, with a bunch of movies. If I was going to put an analogy to it, it's um, it's just fast food movies, and uh, so you know we're getting that quick rush and that quick uh, hit, but it's not really feeding us anything valuable. Whereas there's plenty of movies like all right, let's just go by like Gladiator. Lord have mercy, right? Like what what a film? How like the the uh, like how well the acting is done so that you learn so much from the characters Mm -hmm. and the way that you look at each other and the way they don't look at each other not just like you know you don't have to get it spoon fed to you you know it's just Mm -hmm. like the amount of movies you watch where you're just getting the character spoon fed to you it's like well okay well I know he's got no substance simply because of the fact he had to spoon feed him to me right it's like you don't need that you need you want to be able to figure it out as you go along as well and uh and like that will help you be engrossed in the ride as well rather than being told everything because then that kind of removes you from the experience more too so it's um uh, yeah so you you compare it to something like that where there's story structure there's characters there's legitimate action there's beautiful cinematography there's yeah. excellent script yeah. there's perfect pacing of the movie as well as like it hits so many of the things and look we're talking about it 20 years later as well yeah. and uh, but not in the kind of oh wasn't that a great fun movie because you know there's plenty of movies like for example like kickboxer you know that's just a jokes movie from the 80s and uh, there's really? there's plenty of those kinds of things but uh, but actually looking at it and being like mm that was not only like a great experience but it left a mark as well right so Mm. again like you don't always want that i do want to be entertained as well i do want to just go watch a marvel movie and just be like oh yeah that was some cool explosions and shit but um but also like just just give me a bit of respect as well you know just like give me something more uh, than just uh just that just that surface level bullshit don't give me fast food you know give me give me a healthy (laughs) healthy meal uh along with it yeah I mean, are there films out there? Because I, I can't watch them right now, but are there films out in the cinema that are like that? I mean, I, I suppose I'm not looking for them, those mm. those bigger films, because that's not going to entertain my child. So, mm. yeah, right. Are there? I got, I got no idea. I got no idea. Uh, I mean, like, Dune, yeah. well, Dune's going to be coming out in October, but again, like, you know, that's a, that's a remake. Another one. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but I, mean, I say a remake, it's, uh, it's, it's based off a book so again it's not gonna be something original however that should hopefully be sick Mm. um because like dennis villeneuve he's got a he's got a good filmography you know the director he's he's well from my opinion he's done some good stuff some interesting stuff and then um and guess what guess what oh yeah top gun near me right now he's he's Uh, near me He's I know. five minutes, five minutes down the road. I know, you told me the other day and I've been figuring out how I can just park myself outside your house and just go tomscoping. <laughs> I, I mean, no. I, I wouldn't park yourself, he, where I live, you wouldn't really, it's not very exciting, but <laughs> by the Biggin Hill Airport, that yeah. you, you would probably get a glimpse of him for sure. Right, yeah, yeah. No, that's pretty, it's pretty jokes. Yeah, I guess it was like, 
yeah he just needed somebody mm-hmm. to say while they shut down filming uh but that's hilarious that he's basically on your doorstep but uh, oh, yeah gosh. top gun maverick that's coming out but um but for me i think that's going to be super exciting just because again his 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 somebody who's just giving you the authentic experience you know yes. it's not you're not just like shoving your face with like cgi and stuff it's just yes. we actually did this we flew these planes and we were legitimately sick cool. in these planes right and uh because oh, they, really? they, they they yeah they had to go to fight jet uh fighter pilot uh, yeah. training to be able to handle what they were going to do in the movie and okay. um yeah so they did all of that and they've done some absolutely wild shit that you would never have seen before um and it's all it's all actually done and for me i feel like there is something to that i know people who say is like don't really care um is like whether it was cgi or whether it was somebody who was actually doing the stunts but for me i feel like um, there's something there's something visceral about it that experience yes. of like you don't even have to know but you can watch it and be like there's something different about this and you just yeah. kind of get taken aback so you know that i think will be something to it's impressive yeah uh, yeah that will be something to uh, behold because even though that's going to be like an action movie i can't imagine the story is going to be fantastic it'll probably be pretty straightforward you know but yeah i think it's just i think it's going to be the the purest form of entertainment because you're actually watching somebody <laughs> like uh yeah. well i don't want to put a judgment actually on it, but like you actually yeah you're just watching somebody actually doing something and i feel like there's mm. just something so visceral about that and um you know uh, it's it's yeah it's real um so i think we know that and i think we recognize that when we kind of see it in this very faint way even if it's not an obvious thing to us it's like there's something slightly different about this and like it's why so why his like you know if for example if like Mission Impossible did the crazy plane stunts in the last movie in Fallout, and and because like the diff- one of the differences is like you actually get to see the actor like in the shot like you can do yeah. the kinds of shots which you would never be able to do if it was made up, and um, or if cool. you needed a stunt double or something, and and that again adds to the experience of the actual thing as well, and so when it's done well when something is done right and that much heart and soul is put into it i think people recognize it because i i'm willing to guarantee that i'm willing to bet a lot that um if if it was all cgi there's no way the franchise would have become what it's become i think the fact that people know that tom cruise does these crazy stunts um also makes it a big part of what it is because you just watch and you go wow rather than watching it and be like oh that was some cool that was some cool cgi it just i don't think it would have been what it's become and they wouldn't be making a couple more and it wouldn't be something that's lasted for 25 years you know as a franchise right. yeah. isn't that interesting but, as well that it changes mm. the way you think about something when you know mm. something's real as opposed to mm. something has been uh, made in a studio by computers it changes your experience mm. and that's kind of cool isn't it it's like yeah i think so it changes how you watch and perceive something. It's like, this guy has done this in, in the plane and he's doing it as opposed to, oh, that's a cool graphic. And it, yeah. it makes you feel something different. It almost mm. gives you a bit more empathy that there's mm. a real actor right. doing something. And, mm. and that's kind of cool as well. It, it almost makes it more real. Well, it does make it more real. And so yeah. you're going to have more like I said, empathy, but something else that I can't quite, can't quite reach or get, but that mm. you're, you're going to enjoy that experience more. There's, mm. there's, it's, don't get me wrong. It's cool. I love CGI graphics. I think they're great. I think it's so yeah, impressive, yeah. but there's nothing quite like seeing someone do yeah. their own stunts. Yeah, Tom Cruise, exactly. who's what? 55? How old is Tom Cruise? <laughs> I mean, that's he's impressive. 50, he's 58 now. And, wow. um, yeah. Doing and his, like, still doing his stunts. Wow. Yeah, exactly. He's, um, oh man what a hell of a guy <laughs> but yeah. um but yeah again it's like it's not taking anything away because from cgi movies because there's some shit right. that obviously you can do in that which you wouldn't be able to do otherwise and it's sick um to be able to see that and it's a different mm-hmm. it's a different craft as well in the sense that you know you've got somebody in the studio trying to make this look um look at a certain way yeah and you know that's not taking away from that skill set at all but i think it's an entirely different experience it's, i don't yeah. think it's level i think um i think when we know that that thing that's been done is actually being done is a different thing to knowing that it's um 
um, special effects uh, or, or purely special effects because um, yeah you know even Nolan movies even Tom Cruise movies like they're gonna have some special effects in it because you have to you have to do that but um, uh, but the actual act of trying to pull the thing off um, mm -hmm. so for me I think it's um, I think it's a different experience and um, I think it's a more visceral experience uh, when that happens yeah yeah. I don't know why, but it's reminded me of like a taste test. It's like the real thing or the fake. Right. I don't know why, but you yeah, know what yeah. I mean. It's that kind of thing. It's yeah, like sure. when you realise that oh, it's it's real. It's it does something mm. to you. It's like oh my god. So mm. yeah, it, it, yeah, it's, yeah, it's super impressive. Yeah, well, that, yeah, I guess that makes me think of another thing as well because I guess that's my point of view on it, and I feel like that's true for most people. But then mm. you raise an interesting point by that analogy because you've seen it happen where. Uh, let's say uh, I've, I've seen this being done where uh, these people went to a like a food festival and we're trying to pick up like you know they're just showing people uh, what they produce and mm. um, trying to get into restaurants and things like that and they're like look we make gourmet this gourmet that this is all legitimate um, and what they were showing them was like we make gourmet like you know fried chicken essentially and all they'd gone and done was got McDonald's fried, <laughs> uh, got KFC sorry um, and um, I think that's what they did at least. But essentially the point being, they went to a fast food chain, a very popular one, whether mm. it was McDonald's or whether it was uh, KFC. They essentially made, they dressed their food up to make it look like it was gourmet. So put it on skewers and, you know, uh, made it look a certain way, presented it on a certain type of uh, right. platter and um, gave it to people. And, and they were like, yeah, this is this is great. This is actually legit. I really like what you've done here, you know. So they just got completely fooled by these people dressing this thing up as gourmet and high class. And, you know, you want this in your restaurant. And all they did was just take KFC or McDonald's and repackage it and just sell it to them, essentially. And um, so, yeah, so, you know, you raise an interesting point. Maybe I'm just talking completely out my ass and being like, I think you can no. tell the difference. <laughs> no, it's just, it's just worth considering, right? Because, you know, yeah, maybe for yeah. some people... Um, they wouldn't be able to tell the difference and it doesn't actually like, I, I know there'll be people it doesn't make a difference for because they're like, oh, whatever, mm. I just want to see a movie. But, um, but maybe, maybe it's not on that level just because it kind of goes back to <laughs> what we were talking about a little bit last week of just like, you know, intuitions are a bit, um, scattered, yeah. skewed yeah. or corrupted yeah. and you just don't know the value. I don't know. You don't know worth the, the worth of something, but yeah, maybe it's just, Maybe it's just that same sort of thing going on on a different level, where it's just like you just don't notice as much. Certain, but certain people do, certain people don't. Um, yeah, maybe just open it a question uh, there. I wonder. I think it's also about that if you're the sort of person that's going to investigate what's behind a film and the work gone into it, and you and I are probably people that would maybe look into a film. It's like when I watched Tenet, mm. I then wanted to know everything about Tenet because I loved it so mm. much. And, mm. um, and maybe people just, and that's okay. Like some people just want to be entertained and they don't care whether Tom Cruise has done his own stunts or not. It's just like, is it a good film? Did I enjoy it? What did I get from mm. it? Did, did I, was it worth my money? Was it worth my time? Whereas for you, it means something. It's an impressive mm. feat to, to do your own stunts. And that makes it mm. more beautiful and more authentic for you because, mm. but that, that's important for you. And, and that's perfect. And I think both sides, it's perfectly fine. Um, it's, 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 it's what appeals to you as a person as well and mm. you're right it goes back to what we were talking about last week about intuition and authenticity and what you're what you pick up online and and whether you're getting sucked into something or not you know it's like that shit matters to you mm. and 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 that's great mm. so yeah what do you think um it, like, is there a similar thing for you, like, say, in the music world? Because there could be somebody who's, like, you know, composing their own music, and then there's there's a lot of digital stuff going on now as well, right? Mm. Where there's yeah. plenty of, like, uh, you know, I guess you could call them composers, but all that, like, everything is just digitally engineered. Mm. And um, I don't know, is there a difference for you in that kind of thing? Like, what do you so, what do you notice? Yeah, is it the same? Is Well, first of all, is that, is that a similar thing? And then, mm. yeah, what do you make of it? So this is a really interesting thing. When you were saying that, it made me think of Hans Zimmer. Hans Zimmer has actually mm. got a program um, of all his strings and instrumental music that you can buy to program your own music yourself. It's phenomenally expensive, but mm. he's basically recorded, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but he's recorded strings. So you can 
create music from these recorded strings and he's recorded other stuff so that you could essentially sound a bit like he does and he right. uses it in his own music mm. so but when you listen to his music yes you know there's an electronic element you know that it's maybe not live orchestral music but it doesn't matter because it's done mm. so well so no i don't mm. i don't really have a problem with it it I think we've talked about this before, but with music, I like what I like. I don't care if it's electronically mm. engineered. And, mm. But if I think it sounds really fake and they're trying to do like orchestral strings in particular, like lots of, lots of track lights to use strings. And, and if it sounds fake, I just don't really like it. I think if it's mm. done really well, cool. But it's yeah. when it sounds a bit, a bit mm, iffy, that's when mm. I'm like, oh. But uh, don't get me wrong, I love live, but I think the electronic guys do live very well as well. So mm. it comes back to preference, and I like what I like. Um, mm. There's nothing quite like watching a live or orchestral performance, but at the same time, it's also impressive watching a band. Mm. It's impressive watching producers on stage with all their stuff, and they're making all these crazy sounds, and it all just merges yeah. together, and then somehow they come to somewhere else, and you're like, how the fuck did we get here? So <laughs> I, I think there's beauty in all of it. Um, mm. I like well-produced music, whether mm. it's real, whether it's electronic. Um, yeah, so uh, for me, it's more just about the expression, I think. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I think that's also how you know, about a you? Thing. Um, yeah, that's a good yeah. question. I just I, like I don't I don't really know. Um, <laughs> I don't know okay. if uh, if it does make a difference for me because again I'm just not that well versed. But it's like yeah, I just like what I like. Um, and that's so, okay. Yeah, I mean I've got a, um, eclectic taste of like you know I sent you some stuff by Atmosphere yes. with some hip hop and then I was just mm. talking about you know hard's band and listening to some thrash metal and heavy metal. <laughs> so <laughs> it goes all, all it goes all the way, right? And um, you know still still remember michael jackson's dangerous album is 30 years old this year 30. is it really wow, wow. yeah 1991 it's incredible i think in november it was released so um i mean yeah wow genius yeah so yeah mj all time MJ. all time number one and um yeah right so it's like there's just uh there's just a variety of taste there but um good uh, I guess I don't know. Maybe the 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 uh, maybe the running theme through it is like yeah, there is originality. I guess is like um, yeah. yeah, with MJ is like you know the songwriting and everything and like the, the production of the music. It was just at another level. Um, well, like yeah, around the era when like Metallica came out as well, it was just pretty much um, that was yeah. That was new, I guess, atmosphere mm. for me. Um, I don't know a great deal about hip hop, but um, that they just really, chi I just really chime with them because I think lyrically it's just beautiful storytelling as well as you know good good music um, behind it. Um, yeah, and there's just a yeah, real sense of I guess you know, originality. I mean, but you know, saying that um, there's nothing. Yeah, again, because I'm somebody who just like repurposes material all the time and. Uh, and um and tries you know make something new of it for example like i'm, I'm the the gif man right <laughs> and uh, just making some random reface yeah. uh, like deep fakes and stuff like that all the time because they fit the, the conversation that we're having or the the story that we're uh, that we're telling Funny. so yeah. yeah so so yeah so there's there's something to that art as well but um but yeah so it's not to say that that doesn't matter. Uh, it's not. It's not part of it. But uh, I think the thing. I guess what I'm saying is maybe the thing that originate, uh, uh, resonate with the most is that originality. Because you know yeah. maybe that's just like um, something that. No, it's not that. It's because it's something that feels out of touch. But it is. Uh, it is something that is. Um, oh yeah, highly valued. I guess it just seems original. It's like, or I guess. You know, this is another thing of, um, yeah, you know, you copy one person, it's plagiarism. You know, you copy a few people. Uh, I can't remember what the term is, but you copy a hundred people and that's like originality, right? So I all see, it is, is right. um, yeah, so all it is, is like you've got your various influences and uh, and then you churn out something new with that. And mm. um, yeah, I yeah. think I think that's basically it. Yeah. 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 Ye
I think we're all kind of doing that, aren't we? But there's mm. nothing quite like watching an original film or like a seminal mm. film, like where mm. it's nothing you've seen before or it's just a really clever story. There's nothing quite like mm. it. Mm. And I, you know, I like what I like, but when they, when those films come along or when that piece of music comes along and it's different and it's new or they've just done something really clever, it, it is pretty special. And yeah. hey, they don't come along very often, but when they do, it is mm. really cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, you know, the ones that come to mind are again, like Nolan's movies. What's, oh my God. What's re- yeah. yeah, but what's really interesting about them is like, it's not that they're, um, it's not that they're that out of the ordinary. Like for example, Memento is very originally told, but it's yes. very linear story just told backwards basically. And nobody really mm. has thought to do that on one level in the way that he's done it. And so yeah. it's it's not like it's highly original, but uh, you know, there's some good dialogue in there and there's like the uh, the experience that you have watching it is um, is entirely different to, to other movies. Like The Prestige is another another one where original again i mean like well to the extent that that well that's actually based on a book right so i end up, i'm so glad that i read the book after mm. i saw the movie yeah because that would right. but the thing is but this is like kind of Jimi hendrix taking bob dylan's all along the watchtower and it's it's a different song it's entirely different wow. right it's his own song now it's like you listen to that and you had no idea that it would ever have come from right. uh, all along the watchtower but um uh, uh but so with this um with the prestige he's yeah he just made it it's one of those rare instances where not only is the movie better than the book but it's so much better than the book wow. and yeah because That's again the experience though. yeah the experience they're drawn into maybe i'm um skewed because of the fact that i watched the movie first but i don't think mm. so i think it's actually for me like um categorically it was like this this is a much better retelling of what's in in these pages here and it's also, I think it's also a better medium for the story that was told as well through the book. Right. Like uh, telling in a movie is easier to uh, kind of grasp what's going on with the characters. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so that's another one where it's like, you know, it's a simple story in that it's, it's, it's like rivalry gone bad, gone sour. Um, mm. But um, again, the way that it grips you and the way you're involved as an audience member, you're just like, oh. Such a good film. Yeah, you're, you are... You, you 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 are played exactly how you're supposed to be uh, how they yeah. envisioned you getting played and it's just that i think that's an amazing experience so yeah um yeah so again it's like originally told not necessarily an original idea i mean most stories aren't as well like everything that we ever resonate with is time is timeless but um, yes. it's just new ways it's new ways of telling the same story over and over again so yeah that's what's really that's what's really cool i think yeah oh my god all his films are amazing Mm. and we could talk we could spend the rest of the podcast talking about nolan to be fair Mm. um but for me as well like i i I always talk about this but oh god it's the music with those films as well i mean it's just so perfect Mm. i mean like inception that music is just stunning I mean, yes. they, I just, it just makes the film for me. Like, and that's the thing, it's like, people always ask me, what do you think of the film? And it's like, well, I didn't like the music, so the film didn't really do it for me. It, it's so mm. important to me. If, if the mm. music isn't doing it for me, it almost just dampens down the film. Um, mm. Some of the time, no, most of the time. Um, because I think it brings so much to the story and it brings so much alive. And it, it almost like when, when an actor's doing something that's that's important to the storyline the music has to be on point and i think nolan really uses music in that way as mm. well so mm-hmm. it's so uh, and, and i'm sure i picked parallels from one of his films to the other and i was like oh he's used similar motifs in this and mm. very sad but um <laughs> not at all i uh, <laughs> i can't remember what it was now but i i'm just like oh Oh, but it's it's oh and I'm gonna say his name wrong. Is it Killian Murphy? Yes, it? yeah. It's Killian. No, you're right. Um, and it was the same actor. And I was like, oh, he's used the same mo- motif for Killian. That's really interesting. Right, oh my okay. god, so sad. But um, <laughs> was Killian was Killian in? He was wait. He was in Inception. What was the other film that he was in? Batman, wasn't it? Batman Begins. Yeah. And there was, was one Batman Begins, scene. and he's that was and it. Yeah, he's, it was lip, he's got. 
and yeah, um, yeah he's, the, he's the villain in Batman Begins and also in That's Dark Knight right. Rises he's yeah. got a couple of scenes but a short short appearance yeah he uses the same um, I, I think it might have been Zimmer but he uses the same motif for Killian mm. and I was like and mm. then I tried to google it and there was nothing there and I was like oh okay mm. maybe it wasn't on purpose but he used it and it was like oh yeah. I like it yeah. it's very sad yeah. but um, yeah I really take notice of things like mm. that and and Nolan really likes colours as well. Um, mm. But yeah, it's, it's, I just love things like that. And that's, I think that's what, you know, people pick up on things like that. And that's what makes a film so mm. interesting as well. So, yeah. yeah. yeah what's, your, what's, your, what's your take on the colours thing? So it's more Tenet, isn't it? The, the red and blue oh. and the different time things. Okay. Um, right. But he uses colour. He uses colour and, and colour schemes a lot in his, in his movies, like mm. there's always like contrast and juxtaposition, like in Inception, the color scheme is unbelievable. And he goes from mm. like very, very dark or very oriental to like stark white. And I think he does it in Batman as well. And, mm. um, and I just, I love things like that. So I just, I, I just love that big scene, but it's intricate and yeah, it's, it's meaningful as well to the film and mm. to the story. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's another thing that you can, um, you can pick up on to well, help you keep track of the story as well, especially when it comes mm. to Tenet. And Inception but, as well. I think yeah. Inception is quite confusing. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember like when that came out, everybody's like, whoa, what's going on here? And what just um, happened? God. Yeah, God, that movie's 11 years old now as well. 2010, that came out. No. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Exactly. It was just all sort of flying by. And um, yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so that was again, just yeah, just kind of, kind of mind blowing as well. Like the way the story has been told. Like another thing I like about it is also, mm. you know, there's, it's not necessarily about the characters um, as well. Like they well, are Inception, or like especially like Tenet, for example, is okay. not like because I mean, for example, you don't even you don't have a backstory or anything about the protagonist, right? No. It's just his just name is protagonist. Name. Yeah, yeah, and then you got Neil, but. Um, like he's he's got this obviously very cerebral and conceptual story, but mm. you still have. But by the end of it, you're just like, oh shit! You just have this like weight of emotion towards mm. the characters as well. And even though really? it's like, yeah, yeah, even though it's just more of like a yeah, it's just a concept rather than about the characters. But it still, you still feel for them. So I find that really, really? interesting as well. It's like somehow, yeah. somehow, still makes you relate to them. And uh, even though you know it's, uh, yeah, it's just it's just it's a lot bigger than them. And it's not, yeah, like I said, I think the best word I can use to describe it is like, yeah, you're just putting out a concept on film. It doesn't even give the title character a name, yeah. So you don't really have something to grip you with him. Is like it's, <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> yeah. Go on. Sorry, I'm laughing because something just came to mind. Like hmm. Noah said to me a few months ago, he was like. Is there going to be a tenet too, mummy? And I was like, hmm. I don't think so. Who's like, Gorinda should be the main part. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is amazing. No, you, you, just, you just became my best friend, buddy. <laughs> For life. <laughs> with a statement like that. <laughs> I was just like, what? <laughs> he was like, no, Gorinda, Gorinda should be the main guy. I was like, protagonist. And he was like, yes, him. He could be, be tenet too. And I was just <laughs> that's excellent did he give you a reason why like what was his justification for it i mean but you this, looked this like protagonist <laughs> i looked like john david washington this is oh man that is that's, that's, that's broken me that's that's hilarious uh, <laughs> also, also then he just like i think i think he like put up oh, a picture God. of like him against the podcast I was like see and I was like no really uh, no I don't uh, not at all I don't think he looks anything like it oh, like, oh god could... or maybe no that was it he saw your reface of Tenet and was oh. like he could totally be Tenet too mummy <laughs> <laughs> that makes a lot of sense now. Is that how he looks like him? Yeah, it's because I put my face on John David Washington, <laughs> on protagonist, and made a reface. That's too good. Um, but yeah, respect. Just, uh, I'll, I'll yeah, still take that. 
and it made me Just, really laugh and I forgot to tell you so I'm telling you now but um yeah oh my god yeah it's a tenet two I don't think there is going to be a tenet two there no. might be no no there shouldn't be <laughs> tenet two <laughs> exactly oh god that's excellent <laughs> oh dear oh he's I'll made my day he's made my I'm day I'm going to be a mate yeah. in the matrix come on I'm going to be Neo yeah. Neo and Trinity <laughs> yeah both of them yeah. together same person yeah. you can do that it's like yeah. he moves like they do and then it's you going whoa <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going to be exactly like the first one you know mm. yeah but yeah well, we could we could do a parody. We could we could make you we could make you the lead, yeah. both of them. Yeah, I'll be yeah. up for that. The one yeah. who is also loved by herself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it becomes a, yeah. It becomes a story of like epic narcissism instead. <laughs> no, self love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. We'll spin it that way. It's yeah, an yeah. epic story of <laughs> self-love and transcending. And being the but, one uh, for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It should be. It should be the one for yourself as well. Yeah. Ain't nobody coming to save you. You, exactly. you be the hero of your own story. Yourself. Very, very mm. important. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that's... Um, that was, yeah, that was a good long riff on uh, on movies and music. On film. And, um, but, yeah, but how it, I guess... Um, yeah, I guess I just experiences of it and as well as, yeah. you know, what we what we kind of get out of them, the kind of meaning that we get out of them as well. I think that's an important thing of just, uh, mm. just kind of recognizing is like, it's, yeah, it's really, it is like a cross time type of thing of just the stories that we hear, like the story of like the Matrix, you know, like Neo transcending. Oh, um, like he, well, it's just, um, it's it's a time like it's a kind of like that timeless story of um, just the idea of not wanting you know, like truth seeking, not wanting to be, not wanting to have your reality. Like you want to be living in the real world, you want to have that attachment yeah. to the real world. And yeah. uh, he's finding out that his world is not real, so I got to go through that transformation to um, be actually living in the real world and mm -hmm. accept the the hardships that come with that. Um, and the, yeah, just essentially, it's like yeah, it's a story of self transcendence as well. So I think yeah. that's a, that's the kind of thing sure. that people uh, we've been telling ourselves that story for like thousands yeah. and thousands of years. So yeah, yeah, ah, oh, it's such a great story. Um, mm. I could go on about the Matrix. I'm not going to because we'll spend the next half an hour talking about the Matrix um, and mm. just how much I love that film. But um, mm. that's definitely my all time favorite. Yeah, sure. I was going to ask you some. Yeah, so is it like yeah. by far the all-time favorite? Is it what's the like? What's like so. the distance? What's the distant second? I don't know because do you know what? It's really funny. If you were like, right, are you going to go and watch the Matrix after this? I'd be like, no, <laughs> I think so. But I love that film. Um, hmm. But then I, you know, if you were like, what's your top five? It, it would be so hard. But the Matrix would definitely be definitely be up there. I'm sure there'd be hmm. some Nolan in there. Um, and there'd be things like Back to the Future in there as well. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's like sick. It's like random. Um, yeah. But nothing's nothing's touched me as much as The Matrix, or just nothing affected me as much as The Matrix did. I just I love that film, mm. and yeah. I'll always Can you rip put your off finger it. On it was just. I just think, at that time, I thought the graphics were mad. I thought the story was amazing. I loved. Mm. I love the meaning behind it. I just thought it was mega cool. I thought having a female badass was just, it was for me, it was mega cool. It, it's right. what pushed me into martial art, really. Um, mm. I, just, I just loved all of it. The style, the everything, the, the green behind it. I still think it's classic. Mm. Um, and even now, like some of the scenes, you're just like, oh, it's coming, it's coming. You know, the, the scenes where they just like, and, and just, all the martial arts that they do it, it's just mm. brilliant so and for me nothing's nothing's really touched it in that way and mm. it's probably a bit dated now but i still love it dated in what way 
well, the CGI is probably not that great. I mean, I'm, I'm always like, oh, it's just brilliant. But you know, it still holds up. Maybe, I think because it still the thing holds. Is, yeah, because the thing is, it's not something that was like they weren't u- they weren't actually using wild technology like never done before no. um, CGI. They were actually repurposing uh, a different type of technology. It was essentially like, for example, like the the famous bullet scene, right? It was mm. just like um, pho- it's photography, basically, is what they did. Right. They captured it with photography, and so um, yeah. And but the thing about it is, is like, yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's just not dated. You're not looking at it going. Mm. Um, oh, this was, it must have been amazing for the time, but now it looks like trash. No, it's like, it actually, doesn't. no, it's, it's, it's kind of like, okay, well, this is really like par for the course nowadays as well. But mm. you still, you still, again, get that kind of experience from it. It's like, well, that was pretty damn cool. Yeah. But, um, cause it was just done something. I think that was just done differently. So I don't, um, yeah, I don't think at the moment, I don't think it's actually dead at all, but I don't think no. that movie could get dead for any other reason either. I think. Again, the fact that we're talking about it 22 years later after it's released, that means it's a freaking classic. You know? Yeah, it's such a and, classic. Um, and, yeah. And, uh, but I'm, cu- yeah, I'm curious if, like, you know, 18-year-olds who watch it now, um, you know, Gen Z, think, anybody in Gen yeah. Z is like, are they going to watch that and be blown away like we were or just really resonate with the story like uh, like we did? Um, or is it just going to be like one of those things like, yeah, just watch and forget? Um, but, Yeah. I don't know. I think it comes, yeah. comes back to preference, doesn't it? I think if you are really into your films and you investigate the stuff behind it, because there was, there was so much went into The Matrix, the research, everything, mm. um, and how, how they put the film together. I think if you're that kind of film watcher, even as a Gen Z, then mm. you're going to love that film and, and know mm. that it's a classic. Whereas if you just want to go to the cinema just to be entertained, then you're not going to be bothered. Yeah. You know? But also, no, but I, yeah, I think there's, I think there's more than preference as well. I think there's, again, like the, you know, the timeless story element of it as well and how it's mm-hmm. told. And, um, yes. uh, I think that's, uh, I think that's huge because, you know, there's the stuff that, you know, was, you know, I guess great. I'm just trying to think. It's like what was yeah like there's bl- there's plenty of stuff which is great at the time, mm-hmm. but it gets it does get dated. Um, again, I guess I'm thinking of like you know let's say <laughs> Commando Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh you know, my god, so dated. Like, yeah, but is it exactly you watch or it? Even you're like, Total oh my god. Recall, right? Total Recall, even yeah. Total like, recall, like, Schwarzenegger. Right. Yeah. Cool. So I, it's it's um, again like it's jokes, but also even. I don't know. I guess even that is, I don't know. Uh, I'd have to, I'd have to think about some other examples, but yeah, this stuff that you was like great for the time, but then it becomes, becomes dead. So even though we're talking about it is like, yeah, it's like a classic, but it's also like, you know, when it just becomes a little bit of a parody of itself over time as well, you know? Yeah, sure. Um, and that's it. I don't, th- I don't know if that, yeah, I can't imagine that movie was like, you know, took itself seriously anyway, but also no. it's, um, yeah, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe I could come up with a better example, but essentially, uh, yeah, the point being like, there's always stuff that's great at the time, but then, mm. you know, it just doesn't, doesn't like 10 years later, it doesn't, it doesn't hold up. Whereas, what about something like the fifth element? Do you know what I mean? That might be that's one. That's a good question. I actually haven't seen yeah. that since, since sort of the, like the first time I watched it actually. Um, I don't think that's held up if I'm honest. Nice film, okay. but it didn't help. Right. It didn't hold up. Yeah, I wouldn't mm. put it up there with a the matrix. So, mm. right. Yeah. Would you? Um, yeah. Okay. What do you reckon about uh, Fight Club? Classic. Mm. Absolute classic. So you, I, you know what? I haven't, I haven't watched it. Yeah, I do. I mean, but it, it doesn't have loads of graphics, mm. if any. So it is. It's like seven. Oh. It's going to hold up. So, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. don't even mean in terms of like, uh, I don't even mean in terms of graphics, right? I just mean like, just this, like the whole no, experience the of it itself and yeah, like the story it's the itself. Yeah. It's like yeah. seven yeah. And, and all of those mm. sort of films for me. It's like the Shawshank, it, you know, it's, it's mm. absolute classic film. It's going to yes. hold it. It's going to stand the test of time for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm sure for a lot of people. So. Mm-hmm. 100%. But that, that's that, then we're kind of heading into that gladiator realm of, just beautifully structured, well thought out films. Hmm. Um, it's like The Shining. It's 
still classic. Right. Yeah, okay. You know, I don't that, actually, I haven't, I haven't seen The Shining. Seen it. So still scary. That to, <laughs> yeah, still scary. That, yeah, that needs to get done. Um, um, equally as yeah. good as the book as well. So that's another thing. It's All like, right. I, I love reading the book. For, and I tend to read the book before I watch the film. Um, mm. And The Shining was definitely one of them. And the film is equally and as well done as the book and pretty much has the story of the book well told and retold quite accurately. So I quite like that. Mm. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's definitely Sid the Test of Time, even though 1970s, no graphics, nothing, still damn scary. So clever. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Just dropped a bunch of shit. Hopefully that didn't make too much noise. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just drop your kombucha? No, no, God, no. That would, <laughs> that'd, be a, that'd be a nightmare. Just like trying to clean that up off the ground. Um, <laughs> no, no, just uh, the box that the mic comes in. Oh, just dear. trashed it all over the floor, but it's fine. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, there's... Yeah, there's plenty. Because, yeah, because the interesting thing was... Um, yeah, funny enough, like I had a similar conversation with my housemate who reckons oh. like who's on the fence about Fight Club being mm -hmm. uh, being something that stands the test of time, oh, even really? though it's like, you know, yeah. So but I was like, no, nah, I just I just don't agree. I'm just like, uh, I think because the story. Yeah, because the story that it tells um, still stands now because I mean, like the whole famous scene of um, Brad Pitt you know, just talking to all the guys is like, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, you got sold and uh, you got told that you'll become movie stars and rock stars but you won't you know um we like just it's like our great depression our, our great war is a spiritual war. our great depression mm -hmm. is our lives and it's like bam that is so deep that time and it's especially yeah. true i think now as well right and now. uh yeah. but again it's like you know we're like the lost generation i still think that's happening in fact it's probably even getting worse as well with some of the stats you see about um you know young boys and young men and like how you know they're struggling in life, yeah. Um, and uh, so I think it, I think it applies even more now. And mm. um, again, it's that's a kind of story that also stands the test of time as well. We're just people who are searching for something to have meaning and something that's bigger than themselves. And the way that yeah. uniquely tells a story is that they all <laughs> get involved in something which uh, makes them feel like they've got purpose, makes them feel yeah. like uh, they've got meaning. But um, you know, ultimately, it's not an ideal. It's not an ideal. They essentially become terrorists. So, um, yeah. so yeah. But it's you know, it's a fantastically told story of how, kind of like the, the undiagnosed mental illness of society just kind of simmers at the, uh, just below the surface with someone mm. like the narrator with Ed Norton's character. You know, mm. on the on the face of it, nothing's wrong, but everything's wrong. And then you see what happens to him. Um, I think that's a pretty salient story to be telling now as well, because right now, again, yes. yeah, is uh, uh, someone like I mentioned him last week as well, John Vivaki with his Awakening from the Meaning mm. Crisis lecture series. Um, he's really kind of showing you how, like you know, again, I'm early doors, but the kind of the line of thinking that's opening up. Uh, and also that I'm resonating with. He's just, you know, he's putting putting words to like things that have been on the edge of my understanding for the longest mm -hmm. time. And when you hear the kinds of things he's talking about, it's like there's a crisis of meaning, and it's kind of coming, uh, it's coming to a head. And uh, and that kind of story of Fight Club is just a uh, epitome of that. And so I find it, I find it's going to be something that certainly then, stands the test of time. And then there's relevance. Uh, to it um, yep it's a great story um, I just yeah just thinking about undiagnosed mental health and how so many people are walking around at the moment <clears throat> mm. thinking thinking that they're okay and mm. actually they're not and, and yeah. there may well be under, right. undiagnosed mental health issues mm. um, and the people that are in therapy and are doing the work you know hats off to them and mm. and have and know what's going on it's like mm. yeah there's just there's something in that and mm -hmm. uh, you know I, I take my hat off to anyone that's 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 working on themselves and 
yeah. and, and putting in the time and the effort to, to mm. figure themselves out. Um, yeah. I talked about Absolutely. it a little while ago that, you know, I, I, I have therapy quite regularly um, and I think it's invaluable regardless mm -hmm. of what's going on. It's, 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 it, treat it like a, you treat anything else, like you treat movement and exercise. It's, it's all part of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, I think... Um, I think uh, there's a line by Socrates. I don't know it exactly, but uh, something to the extent, uh, to the effect of, an unexamined life is a life that's not worth living. Mm, so I like that. Yeah. So you got to take it upon yourself to know your shit, figure your shit out, and keep uh, and keep iterating forward into a better mm. version of yourself, knowing with that stuff as well. You know. And uh, when you go through, and I think um, I heard Sam, Sar Sam Harris say a line which was like, yeah, with the unexamined life, <laughs> with if you are going to examine your life, there's going to be a ton of shit in there which can just, like, these aren't exactly his words, but uh, it's just basically going to knock you for six. There's a ton of stuff in there mm -hmm. which can drive you crazy, so you've got to have a bit of a sense yeah. of humor about the whole thing as well. Yeah, <laughs> so, that's really yeah, true. Got, yeah, so you got to examine yourself and be like, oh, shit, this is some pretty heavy stuff, but also kind of take it and um be light-hearted about it as well because mm. i mean yeah you have to <laughs> it's just otherwise uh, you drown in uh, the heaviness yeah. of it or you just good, you just um, yeah you just end up um, getting crushed under the weight of it um, it's like you know when people say you know when people say like oh i i know everything about that or um i'm thinking of the example in anatomy it's like I don't need to learn any more anatomy because I know it all. You know, like you maybe come right. across people like that. And, right. and I, I'm just kind of thinking of that as an analogy. Like, you know, maybe I've said it to certain people that I do therapy, that, oh, I don't need to know, do that because there's, there's nothing going on. I, I know everything. It's fine. I'm fine. And it's like, you don't know. You know, you, you, no. you might think everything's okay, but we well, all go through difficulty and... And I just find that really interesting that I, I love exploring and, and it is an exploration of, of my mind and my thoughts and how I put everything together and past experience. And, and I think it's so important to work on yourself, to develop and learn. And, and I'm always learning. I, I've learned so much about myself, even in just the past couple of weeks. Um, mm. and, I, and, and I'll never stop because it makes yeah. you a better human being and, and then it makes your interactions with other people better. It's yes. like I'll never know enough about anatomy because hmm. there's just so much to know <laughs> and and it's going to be a lifelong learning experience that I'm never ever going to get a handle on because just when I think I am, I'll learn something else or I'll yeah. find something else to understand and and that's pretty cool and I feel like mind works a lot like that. It's like you're never going to unravel everything but you mm -hmm. can only strive to to become the best version of yourself week in, week out, I think. Yes. Yeah. So that's my take on it. Yeah, 100%. And mm. people are walking around thinking that they're fine and that they don't need to work on their shit. And mm. I think everyone does. Mm. I think it's so, so important. And yes. regardless of whether you're working through something or you're not, Therapy is really important. Um, talking is really important. Communication is really important. So that's my take on it. I will always cheerlead and champion therapy. I mean, we, we, we teach therapy. We just teach physical therapy. So mm. this is mind therapy. And, and uh, it saddens me that people will be like, what are you doing that for? It's like, because I want to work on my brain. I want to work on my mind. So... Mm. It's mega important. Yeah, there's, yeah. again, it comes back to that line, the unexamined life. And for anybody who thinks that, um, I mean, yeah, you can be fine. It's like, you know, anybody who's like, thinks that you're fine. It's just, I think, yeah, things can be fine, but it's like iterating to a, to better version of yourself because mm. there's, there's patterns that we got stuck in so we have to build a certain level of awareness around the things that mm -hmm. are genuinely serving us and the things that are not and i find that um i don't think yeah i don't think it's uh becoming of a person to 
to just like you know it was like there's there's nothing to kind of like consider here or to think about here mm. and and um, but truly just looking at like all the I guess like yeah just doing a bit of an audit and just kind of looking at all the things that you do do is like okay well mm-hmm. what am I doing this for is it worth my time and uh, what's it facilitating in my life you know um, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, and so even if it doesn't have to explicitly be like you know going to therapy uh, it can be just doing your own version of it is just like yeah just kind of just just building up levels of awareness so that you can start going oh right i realize i've got this pattern and i need to change Mm -hmm. that pattern up you know um because you know there's bits of there's parts of it that aren't serving me very well so yeah 100 percent is on Mm -hmm. whatever level it is um just yeah constantly be working on working on uh living a better life for yourself because yeah. the 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 kind of like the magnitude of that, the repercussions of that, are, are greater than we ever imagined. Um, you know, in a simple like, you know, one of the things I mentioned to you before, before we started recording was the uh, like earlier today, like the temporal discounting, yeah. right? What does that mean? It just basically means um, putting less salience on things that are in the future. So important temporal being time, discounting meaning literally discounting the value of the thing that you see in the future so the way that it kind of uh, kind of looks is okay the thing that's right in front of you is quite salient um mm. and right you know in the here and now is important to your existence uh, but then uh, we don't think about what's important to our existence a day from now well a week from now a month from now five years from now ten years from now so mm. uh we we discount that um we discount any kind of action towards that uh, outcome or towards something in five, ten years from now, heavily compared to mm. what we what we want to do for now. And um, and the problem with that, obviously, is, is if you're just constantly living for the thing that's right in front of you, um, there's a problem in the sense that you have uh, it's not necessarily equated to living well five years from now and 10 years from now not necessarily it doesn't necessarily mean that you are taking care of yourself for the future as well so right. um but also because like because there's the further something out is to you like okay that moment in time me in five years 10 years from now can look like mm-hmm. kind of anything right you got no idea potentially what it could look like um, and uh, there's a million different ways that that future could transpire and the probability yes. of each one of those futures happening is like infinitesimally small so because it's so small you just start to think that it's not worth like you don't explicitly think it but mm. it, um, your kind of like sense making machinery is just going yeah it doesn't matter because whatever that thing is in the future is so improbable that it's not worth me thinking about. The only thing I should think about is what's happening in front of me right now. Mm-hmm. And uh, yes, yeah, so the problem there is um, you get to five years from now, you get to 10 years from now, and uh, you haven't really. Nothing's um, changed. Yeah, well, nothing's changed, or you haven't really planned, or you haven't really executed in a way which leaves you better off than you were the day before, and the five right. years before that, and the 10 years before that. So. We have to have that ability to look at what's important to us now, but also look at what's important to us from five years from now and 10 years from now and use that as like kind of guiding principles because doing things that are important for the future also provides some level of purpose for today as well, yes. if uh, if that can make sense. So, yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of, it's having that right balance because like you don't want to live completely in the future, you're just going to be anxious. You don't want to live completely in the, in the moment uh, because that means you're not taking care of you f- a, a moment from now, a day from now, five years from now. So it's kind of having the wisdom to know when to focus on just the now and knowing when to focus on um, the things that make you better off in the future and uh, essentially it's kind of like doing things which make you feel like you're going to be better off tomorrow than you are today you know each time yeah. and just in whatever small way that is because it's those little things that add up that compound over time and um, you find yourself in a better position yeah. so it's the yeah it's kind of 
Um, so yeah, so when we're not examining ourselves and we're not becoming aware of our patterns, then we even more heavily discount what happens in the future and we leave ourselves worse, worse off. So even though like, you know, time is drudged on as it always does, mm -hmm. we kind of go, oh like, shit, what just happened to the last 10 years? You know, did I do anything useful? Did I do anything valuable? Um, do I have no regrets? You know, that kind of thing. Um, nice. So it's 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 finding that balance and just kind of having that wherewithal and that awareness to keep focusing on both, like what where you are right now and where you're going to and then acting accordingly. Finding balance is the most important thing. Um, I think it's also about knowing or even thinking about your future and knowing that you want to make a change as well. I think it's very easy to bury your head in the sand, especially if you're maybe in a position where you aren't living your best life or it is difficult for whatever reason. It can be quite easy to not think about it and to maybe ruminate and, and, mm. and, and not put steps in place to make those changes. Maybe it's too mm -hmm. scary, maybe it's just not the right time, maybe you just haven't got it in you, whatever it is, but it, it doesn't have to be this huge life-changing thing. Mm. Like you said, it can be one small thing that you change today that then changes the outcome of your future. Mm. It could be that you drink a glass of water every morning and that then turns into you drink a glass of, glass of water every morning and instead of looking at your phone, you do a gratitude journal. And suddenly mm. that becomes less anxiety driven because you're doing something for yourself rather than looking at your phone, which makes you anxious and then sets you up, a day, up for your day in a way that isn't beneficial for you. Mm -hmm. So then maybe you introduce something else. And so it is finding that balance between toggling between now and something that's going to benefit your future. And, and before you know it, those teeny tiny little steps become a really big thing. Mm. And I'm trying to think of something that I could, I could um, give an example for in my life. So I suppose it, it, it would be and we always talk about it and I always come back to it, but I just think it's so valuable. It's like my sleep schedule, I've worked so hard on it because it, it's so important for my health and wellness to, mm -hmm. to be able to get a good quality night's sleep with everything that I have to do. So I put in such, uh, there were teeny tiny steps at first. It's like go to bed at the same time every night or thereabouts within an hour of, of, that time wake up at a similar time and and just wind down whatever it is that you're doing wind down mm. like that's so important to me so after this podcast I will go and do wind down hour and everyone knows that I do that um and and it is and before you know it you're sleeping better and that has a knock-on effect in everything else that you do mm. mm -hmm. um and it does mean that I can cope with my life yeah at the moment I'm particularly tired but you know, I know with sleep that everything will become back in balance and that equilibrium will be there. So then we talk about balance again. Mm. I put in the steps. I know how to bring back those steps. So, yeah, it's, it's, it could be anything for anyone, but that's, that's my bedrock. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's a really good example of just doing a little bit of right every day and how that compounds into affecting everything mm. else that you do. Yes. Um, because it's just like little things like not getting enough sleep on a regular basis and just how much little energy you have for doing the things that you Huge. actually want to do. Yeah. And then, so yeah, you do that perennially. And it's like, okay, yeah, 10 years from now, you're nowhere near the person you thought you were going to be just because of that something is. as simple as you just felt too tired to take yeah. on your days and uh, put enough effort into achieving the things that you wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, so when you put it like that, it is that kind of butterfly effect you know, going on of just little thing now can be a big thing later because it's Huge. just executing that little thing over and over and over and over yeah. again until it just becomes something that you just do. It's just part of your baseline. Yeah. And then lo and behold, 10 years from now, like, you know, if it comes down to sleep, it's like, okay, I'm not, I'm not struggling with uh, hypertension and potentially, yeah. um, uh, 
what are like in getting diagnosed for uh, like early dementia or something because I got yeah. enough sleep and I was yeah. able to uh, yeah just from a physical point of view I was able to do the um, amount of rest that I needed for mm. uh, for me to make sure that I was healthy later on in life and sleep healthier changes. now yeah sleep changes every cell in your body uh, you regenerate mm. the whole time it's it's how it's how we balance our systems it's how it's how we digest it's how it's how we do everything so it's it's so important for me but it's also how I mentally stay well if I mm. haven't had enough sleep I cannot function and I I can't how am I supposed to function and give people a good session or look after my child if I haven't if I haven't had that sleep so mm. it's like and, and but I've learned about sleep over the last couple of years, thanks to you, Dr. Huberman, like every, everyone that I study, and, and I now know just how important and just what to do to get that good night's rest. And, mm. and it's, it's never gonna change. Yes, yes, I'm gonna have nights where I get less sleep, I'm out, whatever. But for the most part, I have my schedule in place and that probably won't change. Mm because it's so important to me um, and my yeah. life and it has such a knock-on effect onto other people that are in my life as well mm. yeah well that, you know that's, that's that's a big enough reason as well it's like okay, if yeah. you don't give a shit about yourself do you give a shit about some people it's like yeah I do exactly. I do yeah, it for yeah. them yeah it make for it them. make it make it about them like find any reason mm. which you can to to, to do that and that's the yes. like for a lot of people that's a that's a hard thing to do of just it is. kind of it's like i always go back to it is like if you can't fill your own cup how can you expect to fill everybody else's um exactly. if you've got to be exactly. there for other people so you know you've got you've got a preteen son to look after yes. uh, or be there for at least especially while now you know he's going to go through a transition in the next be few there. years yes so it's like you just got to be at your <laughs> be alert to all the crazy shit that's probably going to happen as a result of that and, and um, intuition so, yeah you've got to be able to tap into intuition that we talked about last time and and understand what's going on with him so mm. you have to be alert for that it can't mm -hmm. be like benign parenting of uh it'll be okay you have to be with it for that mm -hmm. so the only way i'm really going to do that with everything else is to get good quality sleep yeah yeah exactly bam okay let's leave it there cool smash that sleep people <laughs> please i'll say it every week until you're tired of me saying it but i will <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah a bit of a different episode today as well just like getting some musings around music and movies but also you know just like what we learn out of them and what we think about them so um yeah, we're curious to know what you guys think about it as well. You know, when you tuned in, it's like, uh, tell us what you think of the episode. Tell us about your top five movies. Um, send them over to us at uh, Evolve Achieve Thrive on Instagram, and uh, or put it in the comments below in the YouTube video. And um, if you're enjoying what we're talking about, if you're enjoying the show, please share it with other people. That's the best way to um, help us grow along with subscribing to the show as well because it tells the uh, all these podcasts and YouTube algorithms that uh, we're worth listening to. So uh, please, uh, please, please help us out on that front and uh, leave us a rating and review as well. That'll be great because it really lets us know that you guys are enjoying what we're talking about and um, you're finding value in it and it spurs us on, keeps us going. So thanks again for tuning in and uh, see you the next time.